it's a it's it's a workshop after lunch right so there is there's a glass half full and a glass half empty as i call it uh, what's the good thing about a workshop after lunch is there anything good about a workshop after lunch you full of energy is the assumption stomach's not rumbling is the good news the bad part is most of you would be a little sleepy so i won't take the whole guilt for putting you to sleep it's probably the lunch that will put you to sleep <laughs> okay i just hope that it's not it doesn't seem like a drag to you um as of now i've been told that uh, we don't know each other and that's fine we can start on a blank note uh not at this point in time do i want to tell you who i am or what i do obviously i talk a lot so obviously i have been a teacher at some point in my life uh i've i've had the opportunity of coming here because i was told that there are all of these uh, you know very very wonderful and talented people who are coming here who may not mind a little hands on workshop here right um, what i do somewhat for the last 7 8 years 10 years now is origami um how many of you know what origami is anybody at all do you know what origami is paper art okay anything else anything else have you seen have you seen this somewhere you, i there's no test i won't ask you to make it have you seen paper boats have you seen uh, paper fans somewhere yes so origami is nothing but uh, the japanese art form of folding paper right okay so that's that's what origami is that's what i do but then why am i here because gradually over time i've also um, realized that a lot of what we do as origamists or as artists blends together with what a lot of innovators are doing today i'm also um, an hr professional and ex hr professional and i realized that a lot of hr concepts and theories about how people learn were uh, coming out in my classes as an origamist so what i'll do is i'll first throw some theory at you uh, and then we'll get on, uh, get hands on with paper but if you notice you've already been given paper is that right does everybody have two sheets of paper three sheets of paper are there different sizes of paper that you have yes okay if you can take the largest sheet of paper and just show it up can you put it up in your hands okay your first challenge and you have 2 minutes with the largest sheet of paper that you have is that if you look at the person on to your left or to your right just partner with one person what is the one gift that you can pack into a sheet of paper what's the maximum number of things that you can pack into one sheet of paper that's all that's all that i'm telling you right if you had to give something to the person sitting next to you in one sheet of paper what can that sheet of paper carry or wrap or fold into whatever it's an open ended question your time starts now you can fold it you can crumple it you can hold it whichever way it doesn't matter right the only constraint is you can't you can't use anything but a sheet of paper but you can do anything that you feel like with it the person to your left or right or if you're lucky you'll be the person in the middle who'll get from both sides you can tear it you can crumple it you can fold it what can one sheet of paper carry what can you gift your neighbor in one sheet of paper it's not a test you can look left and right and cheat and that's fine there's no pressure to fold it just because i said it's an origami workshop you don't have to fold it you can also carry something in into it on top of it whatever
You're not gifting your, okay, all right. Okay, another 10 seconds. Another 20 seconds or are we done? Are we done? No. Another 10 seconds. Half a minute. Sure. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. I'm glad you remember it. Anything at all. So you came a little late. I had said your first challenge is to just play around with paper and you need to gift her, any, any neighbor, uh, anything that you feel like in paper. So what can a paper carry or become? Right, which you'd like to gift to your neighbor. So, if you're if you're gifting a water bottle or a pen or a or a phone to your neighbor, don't worry, you can take the gift back. The point is not to give it away. The point is to just play around. <laughs> Anything at all. Okay, okay. Shall we stop? Shall we stop or do we need the last 10 seconds again? Last 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Please exchange. Please give your gift. <laughs> Okay, uh, can I have any five people who would like to show everybody else what they've received? Any five people? Yes. So would you like to just tell them what it is? At the back, can you see what he's holding here? So there's a, there's a paper crane there. What, you have to describe it. It's like a boat, okay. There's another paper aeroplane there. Okay, thank you, sir. What is that? It's a case, it, specs case. Oh, so she's used it as a wrapper. What you've done is you've made products of paper. Anybody else? Yes? You can put anything in the paper. I'll just try putting my laptop there. <laughs> right, right, right. And, and there's an envelope of paper. Okay, perfect. It's a tray to put pens in. Oh, perfect, okay. All right, perfect. Okay, your next, next quick exercise. You can put your gift away very carefully, very preciously. Your next, um, one second. Yeah, you have another large sheet of paper, right? What's the smallest that that sheet of paper can become? You have another two minutes to do this. What is the smallest that that sheet of paper can become? Whatever. You can cut it, you can fold it, but you can't cut it into little bits, right? So whatever you do, that sheet of paper should stay together and it should become the smallest. How can you compress it to the smallest possible size? Actually, just a minute for this. How would you fold it? How would you, what would you do to it? So that it becomes the smallest possible size. Yes, you can tear it, absolutely, but you can't spread the, the scatters of the paper all over. The paper should stay together. Okay, you have the last half a minute left. My audience here is more organized than I've ever, ever met. You're so meticulously playing around with paper, it doesn't seem like play. It's almost meditative to watch you. <laughs> Done? Super.
How many of us need the last 10 seconds or a minute? Just raise your hand so that I know how many are in the majority here. Okay. All right. Okay, can you just pick whatever you've made of that paper, can you just raise it and look around? Can you just raise it and look around? Just look at what everybody else has done. Can you just raise it and look around? Is there a model that's smaller than yours? Can you see a model that's smaller than yours? Can you see a model that's smaller than yours? Yes, yes. Is there anybody who claims to have made the smallest compression of the sheet of paper that I gave you? Which is the smallest model here? Is it yours? Is there something smaller than that? Or smaller than this one here? Sorry? It is not all? It's not made from the full sheet? Oh! <laughs> no, you had to use the full sheet. <laughs> Oops, okay. Anybody else? Is that made? Now I should ask that question each time. Is that made from the full sheet? Okay, is, that some, is there something smaller than that? Is there something smaller than this? These two? Are these the smallest that we have? Yes? Yeah, that's a model. That's a model that you've made, correct. What you've done is you folded it multiple times, right? One, two, and three. Anybody else who's done that? Anybody else who's folded multiple times? Sequentially, half and then quarter and then one eighth and one sixteenth? No? Okay. Sorry? It's a boat. Okay, perfect. Anybody else? You also did it multiple times? How many of you thought of crumpling it? You did, right? So then did you, did you get it smaller than that? Can you make it tighter? Just try. Can you make it tighter? I'm going to give a sheet to everybody again and I want you to try crumpling. Can you just take and pass? Just try crumpling it into the smallest size possible. Just crumple it, take a fresh sheet of paper, just see if you can crumple it into a solid, solid body. Why? So what? That's okay. No, it won't. It won't. Just try. I'll give you, I'll give you. Can you make this tighter? Not possible. Why? It won't be like this. Why? But you're not damaging it, you're just compressing it. It won't be elegant to look at, is that what you're saying? It won't be, there'll be no purpose to it. But the purpose is only to compress it. That's the only purpose, yeah. Yeah, that's the only purpose. It won't be as elegant as this, but try it, try it, if it can be smaller than this. Just try, try holding it harder and harder. See if you can compress it into smaller than the pieces that they should. Can you compress it tighter? Can you compress it tighter? Can you compress it even tighter? Nothing stops you from stamping on this to make it tighter. Nothing stops you from chewing it to make it tighter, right? Nothing stops you from looking at it like atta to make it tighter. That's perfectly fine. Okay. Can I just borrow this? Okay. Does anybody's crumpled ball seem smaller than this? Does your crumpled ball seem smaller than this? Yes. Is it smaller than this? Yes. Yes, okay. Anybody else? Anybody else? Is it smaller than this? It's another model? Okay, you've crumpled it. Okay, it's smaller than this roughly. Yeah, those of you who've got a crumpled ball which is larger than this, just for, for 10 seconds think why. Why is it larger than this? Can you crumple it further? You can't crumple it further? It's nice and hard. Why is it larger than this then? Why is this a stronger compression?
there is a pattern to compression, it is more systematic. I do not know, what if I say I do not have a right answer. I am trying to wonder why is it that your crumpled ball has more volume inside it probably than this. What is that? What does that mean? What does that mean? Uh, it, it is not fully packed. Right. It has some kind of the voids inside. Right, right. Yeah. There are some gaps inside, yeah. right. So, there are parts of the paper which are probably also resisting each other's layers, yes, right. Exactly. Whereas, what he has done here, which some of you also have done, is that you are just making the layers on top of each other yeah. at, e at every point, right, at every step. Is that right? Is that right? Yeah, okay. Remember this for an activity that we will do sometime later, okay. We will get back to uh, the next slide. You can keep your uh, crumpled paper balls on the side. Please do not use it on each other. Uh, okay. Uh, what I am going to show you right now is how um, in my journey of being an origamist, I have realized that there is a lot that overlaps between origami and engineering or design, right. So, today's presentation is actually called origami uh, with design thinking or you can flip that design thinking with origami, right. Now, what you have in front of you is probably a, do you have a pink post-it, a light pink post-it? Yeah. Can you, can you quickly think of words that come to you when I say design? What are the words that come to you? you do you have a sketch pen with you or a pen, right? What are the words that come to you when I say design? You do not have to show it to anybody, just keep that post-it. The light pink post-it, right? You have about half a minute to think over this. What are the words that come to you when I say design? Anything at all. There could be multiple words. There could be 10. If you want another post it, I will give it to you. Not a problem. No, no, write on the pink paper. Just so that it is easier for me to figure out what activity we are on. Any words that come to you when I say the word design? You do not have to write your name on it, so you can write whatever words come to your mind. Yes? Do we need another half a minute? Okay. Okay. Now look at that little poster that you have and see if you think differently when I say design thinking. So, the words that came to your mind when you thought of the word design, are they different to how you understand design thinking to be? Have you heard of this terminology used quite often these days, design thinking? It is the buzzword for anything at all, right? Even when I have to tell my daughter that she needs to get into her homework mode, I genuinely feel that I am, you know, sort of designing the whole process for her. Where should she sit? How quickly she should do it? What should she take out? How much do I feed her so that she doesn't get up, etc., etc., right? But we'll come to uh, examples like that later. When I say design thinking, can any of you take guesses about what it means or what it could mean? Because designing sometimes is thought of as a doing activity, right? When I'm designing something, I'm doing something, right? Probably with, with, a machine or with my hands or it is it's more like a verb, right. But when I say thinking, it is more abstract, right. So, when I say design thinking, what does it mean to you? Yes. Um, 
Okay, so what she's saying is probably some sort of a strategy to find a solution to a problem, right? So it's probably an approach to finding a solution to a given problem, right? Okay, any other answers at all? Any other answers? Sorry? So make some, to make something or to design something optimally so that it has multiple uses, okay, okay. Anything else? Yes? A type of representation. A type of? A type of representation. Could you flesh that out for me? Could you? If I have to build something uh, very large, mm -hmm. so we can design it very sm uh, smaller thing and it is a type of representation either in computer or model type. Okay. So, it's type of representation. So, to make something that's a smaller prototype or something that's yes. bigger. Okay. Organizing things, okay, to probably put in systematic processes into building something or Okay, okay. So did you hear that? She's saying a process of putting in sub-processes so that things become more, more organized and more manageable, right? Now design thinking is a term that was um, not invented by Stanford, but it was popularized by the Stanford Design School, right? And if you just Google it up, I'll save you the hassle right now of going through a million slides about the history of design thinking. Just google it up after this and you'll realize that design thinking is quite a buzzword across a lot of design schools. Uh, IDEO is a design firm which popularized this as their main business offering, right? So what do they do? They teach design thinking, right? Uh, it's a design firm that was also funded by or sorry founded by a professor in Stanford D school. And there are different processes to it, but if I, I'll, I'll take you through the details and it can get a little heavy and please raise your hand if it does get heavy. But if I simplify it for you, it's pretty much what she said and what you also said. It is nothing but, it's not only about design, it's about the process, right? It's not about what you're doing, but why you're doing it, how you're doing it, for whom you're doing it and what is the end product, right? So it's not only about designing something, it's an approach to problem solving, is that right? Yeah. Now when I was growing up and I was doing my MBA, the buzzword that time was Six Sigma, right? Have you heard of these approaches? Six Sigma, Lean and you know all of these. The, the word or the term, term design thinking um, is becoming more popular is because apart from all of these things, it keeps its focus on the end user. Okay, through various stages, you keep coming back to who's the end user? What does the end user want? What is he saying? So the customer focus is so strong that, uh, that design thinking has found its own momentum right now, right? Uh, it's like I said, it's more than a set of processes and it demands a mindset shift individually and organizationally, right? Which is why there are lots and lots of online courses which will tell you that you can learn design thinking with a certificate course for three days, three months, even a whole year, right? If you look around you, everything around you is designed, right? Either there are products, which could be the tables that you're using, the chairs that you're sitting on, or even experiences, right? Bec for example, why, if I ask myself, are you in a semicircle right now, right? Why are you not in straight lines? Or why are you not all around me in a circle right now? Why am I facing you? Why are you not facing each other? So if you notice for various reasons, it has been designed like this, right? Why is the projector at the back and not on your phones, right? Why can't you see this on your phones? Why have we even, you know, collected here, right? So whether it's products or experiences, everything is designed around you, which means that you don't have to be a designer to design anything. What you did in the first activity was make the most of that one sheet of paper to design something under the design problem that I gave you. Technically, that was the design problem. You have the constraint of time and material and you have a purpose, which, you, which is that you need to gift your partner something, right? Now, that's the simplest activity that I could think of. I'm sure there's something simpler as well, right? But we'll get on to something a little more complicated after this. Um, the simplest definition that puts everything together is that design thinking is basically an approach to find the problem, right, and to solve a problem. 
it's an empathetic way to find a problem and a creative way to solve a problem with a human centered core and the idea of design thinking as an approach is that it's action oriented right pretty much like this workshop started you don't start by saying okay we'll do all our research and figure out what others have done and our grandfathers in industry have done etc you figure out who's your end user what is the problem that they're solving quickly prototype test it out and iteratively improve your product and your understanding of your end user right which doesn't mean that you forget what the grandfathers have said you study all of that as well but the focus is on the end user is that right um, a lot of times we end up thinking that designing is at the core of design thinking right uh, but essentially it's thinking which is so, which precedes design thinking, which the, the part where you're thinking about why you're doing and what you're going to do is more important than the designing itself, right? Uh, you, you would probably come across this very commonly. Uh, Human-centered design is really that white area there, right? So it's the intersection of what people need or what is humanly desirable, what is technologically possible, right? and what makes sense as a business to be profitable, right? So design thinking is at the center. So that's the part that's innovative. Because if it's, if it's anywhere with, uh, with just the two of these, where it's technologically possible and it makes money for the business, but human beings don't need it, it's not really an innovation. Is that right? Yeah? If, if there are no end customers, it's not really an innovative need. Right? And there are multiple examples that you can think of products which have failed because they don't lie at the center there. Right? So that's what design thinking is. It has to meet the three subsets over here, which is that it has to make money for the business, it has to be technologically possible, and at the very core, it has to be needed by the people in question. Now, these are the various steps that uh, the D school, which is the Stanford Design School, states. Right? The first step they say is empathize. Now when, for example, I threw open the question to you that you need to gift your partner something, did you ask what your partner needed? No, right? Because there was a time constraint. You had that sheet of paper and you had to quickly do something, right? But if, if you just step back and if I told you take 10 minutes over it, you would have probably struck a conversation with your neighbors and you would have probably asked them, what would you like actually, right? Would you want a pen holder? Would you just want, you know, an envelope? Would you want a crane? Would you want a fold of some kinds? That part is called empathizing, which means you, you basically learn about the end user. The next step is defining, right? So when I gave you that problem that you need to make a, make a gift for your partner, a lot of you asked me one or two questions, right? That bit is defining. So can we cut it? Can we tear it? right and exactly what is the thing that you call a gift do i have to just make anything and give it is that the only definition of this design problem that was in this particular case the only definition was make something you don't mind parting with for 10 seconds right the third is ideating right a typical design group supposing you were a group of here you were an individual but if you were a group of five or six people you would have different ideas right yeah as if I, if I gave all of you one one sheet, you came up with five, six different ideas. Imagine if I told all of you that you had to make one or two gifts for the next group. That would be even tougher, isn't it? Right? But that's where the ideating comes. That's where you have different kinds of perspectives. Right? So that bit is called ideating. Prototyping is what we just discussed, where you don't wait for a perfect theoretical uh, you know, idea to come onto your computer, go through different levels of, you know, bureaucracy and hierarchy, and then you get started with the final product. You prototype quickly. Uh, what, what do you think is the definition of a prototype? Anybody at all? When I say prototype, what does it mean to you? Something that's workable for sure. Yeah, something that's workable. Anything else? Correct. It's a demo product, something that's workable for sure, not just a drawing, right? It's probably also something that the end user needs. It's rough, right? It's not the final, final model, but it's still usable, right? So it's somewhere between what you think will work and what you will actually offer. 
right? And the idea of prototyping is you make a rough model, you test it out, you figure out what the problems are and then you iteratively innovate and improve your model or go back to understanding what exactly was the human need that we were addressing that our prototype is failing at, right? So you keep coming back again and again. And finally, you have to test it out with the user, right? So at every stage, you actually end up coming back, all right? I'll, I'll show you how that happens. Uh, the, the, if, you go, if you go and see the Stanford Design School website, this is what you'll get. This is a how of all the different steps. So they say, for example, when you have to empathize with your end user, you take interviews, right? You ask the end user, so okay, if you want a better seminar hall, what would you like? Right? So some of you may say, I want refreshments, I want to be able to sleep, I want to be able to hear, I want to be able to fast forward the speaker, etc., etc. Right? That's interviewing. Shadowing is when you just sit with your end user and you you're like a, a bee, a fly on the wall. You're just watching what your end user is doing. Seeking to understand and non-judgmental are things that you need to have, uh, you know, if you want to empathize better. If you look at define, if uh, to define a problem, you'll have to figure out what are the challenges that your end user has understood. So when you empathize, after that you're able to understand the problem of the end user or the needs of the end user a little better, right? And then when you ideate, you share ideas together as a team and then you think of, there are so many different you know, issues that my end user has, which are the ones that are, that we are going to focus on, right? And then at the ideate stage also is when you, you come up with a lot of different solutions. So the idea is not to get the best answer. The idea here is to go over quantity rather than quality of ideas, right? So for example, if you had to gift something to your, to the next group over here, come up with not one answer or not two answers, come up with 10 or 12 or 15 or whatever. Right? Because there's a comfort zone of human thought and then you stretch that further and then you stretch it even further where you tend to become a child and you start thinking outside your own box. Right? So the idea is to not think only outside one, one box over here but outside five boxes, have 25 ideas and then debate them. So which is why the ideate, uh, you know, stage takes a really long time. Then you come to prototyping which we've discussed. And then finally, you test it up. You ask yourself, what do you think will work, right? You also have role plays where you say, okay, if I'm the end user, what would I look at, look at in this particular prototype, which will help me or not help me, etc. right? Um, if you again come back to, you know, what are the things or the, uh, you know, the, the attributes that you need, right? Uh, for each of these stages, this slide will probably tell you that. So if I go to the first one, for example, um, for empathizing, you would have to be observant and you would have to be uninhibited, right? You would have to be comfortable asking somebody, what is it that you really want? What is it that's so uncomfortable about this chair, right? If I, if I ask you, what are the things that you would need to be able to understand the second stage, some of you would probably say that you need to be collaborative and curious, right? You will have to understand what your team members are saying. You will have to understand how to work with your team members because the truth is you have to work with not just your team members but also with the end users, right? When you come to the ideate stage, you will have to garner an ability to visualize. The more you write things, the more you draw things, the more you can sketch things, not pretty ones, but if you put it down, it just makes it easier for you to, to visualize your own ideas, right? And you have to come up with mad ideas. Like I said, beyond your comfort zone, you know, rather than think of one idea of gifting, what were the five, six ideas that you could all come up with, right? And then prototype. So the important thing over the prototype bit stage is that you need to come up with many wrong ideas, many things which will not work. Right? So when you come up with the first solution that you think will work, you ask yourself, okay, this is okay, yes, this will work and what else can work? This will work and what else can work? So in design thinking as a process, you don't make one prototype necessarily. You can make two, you can make three. So that if one prototype doesn't work, you have a second one all ready to test out something else that you thought. Right? And then you come up with the last one, which is the test stage. where can you think of the big picture? 
what exactly are you testing? Because sometimes we are so excited with our prototypes, we forget about the end user or why we are trying to create what we are creating. Right? So, the important thing to, to understand at the testing stage is that what is the value that it brings to your end user? Why will he want to come back to it? Right? Now, this is called the, these are all called looping phases. If you have a look at this slide, it will show you that at every stage you keep coming back to some stage or the other because it helps you understand or rethink what you've assumed at every stage. So, just because you're testing doesn't mean that you only check your prototype. You also ask yourself, have we just, you know, understood the end customer differently? Have we learned something else about, you know, how we define the problem, right? And this is a neater version of what actually happens in a design process. In the design process, it's usually like this, right? You keep coming back to different stages again and then again and again. And what I've done here is, you know, you, we classified it into three stages where you understand, observe and find a point of view, uh, which is you define the problem and that stage is called the inspiration. The ideation is when you come up with options, when you come up with solutions. So, this is problem finding, this is problem solving and that is the solution launching, okay, which is where you have a story about why you've created what you've created, why it will work. You have a pilot and then it works for the business, right? So, that's why it's a, it's a looping process, right? Now, this last bit, if you can think of the number of ideas that will come to you in the inspiration process here. If you're looking at how do you understand, what all do you understand from different users and their observations, you'll have a, a plethora of information, right? Yeah, so that's when you're, you're, diverging in a large number of inputs, right? So, you diverge in the number of ideas that you have, then you narrow down on what are the things that we can fix. So, that's why I say you converge over the ideas that you come up with and then you again diverge with the number of solutions that you can come up with, with the few problems that you've chosen to solve, right? And once you diverge from there, you narrow down on the one solution or the couple of solutions that you think will work. And that's where you converge again. So, your ideas broaden up at this stage, then you narrow them down again, then you, as a solution you broaden up and then you narrow it down again, right? Now, if, um, if all of this is overwhelming right now, uh, let me promise you that when we come down to working with paper again, it will seem slightly more reasonable, okay? Um, I'll, I'll just go quickly over uh, this slide. This is again a recap of, you know, what are the different kinds of abilities that you need with Stanford Design School states. So, they say you need to navigate with ambiguity, which means you should be comfortable saying, I don't know my customer, right? The assumption here is all of you want straight back chairs, all of you want flat, uh, you know, straight tables, but maybe not, right? Uh, the other thing is you need to learn from others, which is obvious when you're working in a team or from an end user. Because what happens is, if I call myself a designer, there's a certain burden of uh, my ego that comes in, right? There's a certain burden of expectation that comes in. How can I not know the answer? Because I studied in a design school, right? How can I not know how to do accounting? Because I am an MBA in finance, right? So I'm saying, can you, are you open to saying, I don't know, right? And that's important to, to be able to look at or listen to your user and to be able to look at even your team members, right? And then how do you, you know, in, in those two stages of diverging and converging, there's a lot of information synthesizing, right? I've heard all of these, I've seen all of these people in the mall, but I'm still not able to understand what is it that young mothers want for their children to be quiet inside a mall, right? There's so many inputs that you have, we've taken videos, we've taken pictures, but what does it mean, right? So that's the ability that's essential there. Again, because we talked about prototyping, are you open to experimenting rapidly, right? Can you make something, test it out, bring it back, test it out and be a little, you know, distant from it emotionally. Just because you've made it doesn't mean it's the best thing that you can come up with. Doesn't mean it's the best thing that your team could come up with also, right? So, can you be a little distant to that? And then all of these, if you look at them, they're largely similar to move between concrete and abstract, which means 
I can, you know, to say that I have a genuine defined problem and then to think of what are the, what are the different options that I have not yet thought of, right? So from something that seems very specific, I don't want a flat surface over here. I want a surface with, you know, some sections over here. To just say maybe I don't need tables at all, right? To, to be able to think beyond your box and to build and craft intentionally, which means you need to be able to work with your hands, to work with your minds and to maximize the abilities of your team members. The third is to communicate deliberately. If you just read that up, it's really the ability to talk to the user in such a way that they are able, that you can cull out information that's needed, to talk to your team members in such a way that you can bring out their ideas as best as possible, to be able to come up with your own ideas and communicate your own ideas in a manner that will make sense to your team and become an, an active prototype. And the last is to design your to design your design work, which means to look at a problem and say this is a design problem. This is not just a technical problem. This is not just a process problem. This is not just because somebody ha you know just thinks of it as a problem. This is genuinely a problem that we can solve, right? Why then is an origamist talking to you about all of this? I'm sure the the question has hit you over the last half an hour. Right? Why is it that I'm talking about this at all? Uh, there's a lot that's happening in the origami world which overlaps with product design right now, which overlaps with experience design right now, right? So I'm going to quickly take you to unfolding origami for you. Uh, if I just ask you what are the words that come to your mind when I say origami, I'm sure paper will. Are there any other words that come to your mind when I say origami? Paper, poles, creativity, anything else? Okay, do me, a, do me a favor, take another post-it and write down all the words that come to your mind when I say the word origami. It could be just three words, it could also be ten words, whatever. Just take ten minutes, sorry, ten seconds to think over what are the words that come to your mind. Uh, don't use the light pink, take any other color. Take any other color. When I say the word origami, what are the words that come to your mind? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, can you take that post-it? Can you take that post-it from your partner? And can you stick it on that square here? So can can one of can all of you just come and stick it over here all the words that come to your mind with origami you can just stick it here and you can get back to your places you have like i said 10 seconds to do that 10 9 8 7 Six, five, four, three, two, one. Super. Thank you. So people in the origami world come up with a lot of words like this. Just see if you have any of these words on your post-its or in your minds. There are words like mountain, symmetry, creative, forget, 
pleasure, discovery, diagrams, square ended, passion, solving, enthusiasm, and thankfully also innovative and models. Okay. Any are there any words over here that surprise you? That seem completely unrelated? Laptop. Why laptop? A lot of origami is taught through online tutorials. That's why maybe I'm just guessing. Anything else that surprises you here? Friends, yeah. A lot. There are there are lots of uh, origami clubs, uh, even in in our cities. In fact, Bombay is really the headquarters of origami in the country. There's an origami group here that does an annual origami exhibition. And what happens is typically folding by yourself is very boring. So people tend to get together in groups, you know, it's un unlike other hobbies where you're playing the guitar or reading a book or listening to music, you'd want to do origami with somebody else, right? Probably that's why why it says friends. But essentially, if I give you a bite size, uh, you know, a history about origami, it's really the art uh, of, of working with paper or folding paper, where you use one uncut square sheet of paper, right? That's the, that's the traditional Japanese definition of origami. If it's coming off, it's okay. We'll put it back later. Maybe because it's the felt. Uh, it, it originated in Japan, but that's not where, uh, you know, it's growing right now. That's not only the place where it's growing right now. What's happening right now is all four of these terms are being questioned across the world. Why should we use just one sheet of paper? Why not 104? Why not a thousand and you know eight, right? Why should it not have any cuts? Why should I have a paper which doesn't have any cuts? What if I fold a cut piece of paper? Why should it be a square? So there are people who are finding all sorts of polygons, even circles, and they're folding models out of that, right? And why should be it be a sheet of paper? Why can't I fold polymers? Why can't I fold wooden panels? Why can't I fold plastic or metal or fabric? Right, and that's where the renaissance of origami is happening right now. Um, so paper was invented in 200 AD. In our class six social studies textbooks, we heard about the word papyrus, and that China had invented paper, and that paper was so heavy that they couldn't fold it. It was actually like cardboard. Right, uh, the Buddhist monks brought uh, brought paper to Japan, and the Japanese were fascinated completely. They didn't invent paper, but the amount of play that they had with paper, the various things that they came up with paper were very interesting, right? Um, it's the, the art of folding paper is called zezi in Chinese and orikami in Japanese. Ori means folding and kami means paper, right? So if I say kirigami means cutting paper, then what's the Japanese word for cutting? If origami means folding paper, and kirigami means cutting paper. Kiri means cutting. What does gami mean? Or kami mean? Paper. What does ori mean? Folding. So you've learnt your first three words in Japanese. Right? Okay. Uh, the best known origami model is what you made, I think. That's the, that's the paper crane. Right? It's called the suru. Uh, the earliest references of origami are in a short poem in 1680. And a traditional butterfly design which was used during wedding ceremonies in uh, Japanese culture. Uh, it's, it has been always known as a popular children's activity in Japanese culture, right? But it's not so anymore. This is what paper folding was. Are we familiar with all of these? The, the paper aeroplane, the crane, the boat and the fan. Are you familiar with all of these, right? Are we familiar with any of these? This is what origami promises to be. And these are, uh, believe it or not, actual products being sold on Etsy, right? Uh, that's, if you notice, that's, a, that's an accordion folded gift wrap. This is a lamp. One, two, three are lamps. And these are examples of origami packaging being used, right? What about these? This is what our origami is right now. Can you see origami in cardboard somewhere? Can you see origami in fabric somewhere? Can you see purposeful origami, origami with a functional purpose somewhere? 
and can you see origami as an art form somewhere on the slide? Just as an art form. What about this? A lot of, um, there has been a lot of excitement about using origami for, for cards, for invitation cards or as shelters for the homeless, especially in disaster relief areas, right? Uh, this is another example. In fact, this is on Kickstarter right now because they want funding for, uh, you know, low cost housing made of cardboard based on a model actually which is here. It's based on a model like this, right, over here. What do you think this is? Sorry? It's a door, correct. But why would you have such a cool kind of door? What's the purpose of making a door like this as compared to a regular door? To save the? Correct, exactly. So the person who designed this said, when you have doors, they, they waste, you know, that whole, whole arch area. You can't sit over there, you can't do anything, you can't keep anything there. So why not have a, you know, triple hinge door like this? shop, this is actually somebody's home which he, you know, installs wherever he goes. If I said I want a huge house, but I want it anywhere, right, and you're on the first stage of design thinking, which is empathizing, right, I want a massive house, but I don't want to stay in one place, you would probably come up with something like this, right, or something like this. So that's the fast version, and that's the inflated version. What would, be, what would be the design from the object? What would the end user want? What's the product like? So when, when I have winter in Bombay and I want to sit outside, I'll be fresh, right? When it's not raining, my piano probably will probably sit like this. And during rainy, on a living year, I'll be sitting on the shelf like this, right? So how do I make low cost piano shop for Mumbai shelf here, correct? Look at the next one. actually made of fiber. It's like a cushion, right? And when you have to roll it, you take out the sticks and you put them in a little pouch like this and you roll the whole fabric. And this gives it a kind of, you know, flexibility to suit any office space. I mean, I could roll it out over here and you could snake it whichever way you feel like, right? So that's the same as the staircase over there. That's an example of an IKEA staircase where it comes in a box like this thing. An entire staircase which takes about you know ground floor to first floor and a little beyond. The whole thing comes in a box like this. So you just unwrap it or unfold it. What about something like this? What's the what's the purpose of that sofa there? Can you just lay your hand? Yeah, sorry. 
Exactly. It's actually a mattress. Somebody thought if I have a mattress during the daytime, I'm not moving. What I need during the day is a sofa, not a mattress. So what if I just had something to clasp this at the back, right? And when I want it at the end of the day, I just open it up. Okay? Somebody must have thought something similar for the bookshelf over here. Right? And that's probably what a lot of foldable furniture is, is basing itself on. This is largely uh, paper. If you notice, it's the strength of paper that comes from folds made in a certain way. Right? If, if you notice in the second exercise that you did, the paper was beginning to resist, isn't it? When you crumpled, it seemed initially that you can crush it in whichever way. But folding was easier no, than crumpling it to that small size that you wanted. Right? So that every time you have, you make creases in paper, it either increases the strength of the paper or makes it more flexible. One of the two, depending on the direction of your force. Right? What do you think this is? What's the purpose of something like this? It's called rest more, which means rest more. But what would be the purpose of something like this? Sorry? Yes? At airports, correct. Why would you need something like this? It's like a recliner. So when you fold it, it looks like that on the left. These are many resmos put together on the right. So it's something as sleek as that, right? And it opens up into different, different ways of seating in an airport, right? Depending on whether you want to lie down, you want to sit, you want to sit with a, a leg rest or you want to sit like that, whichever way you feel like, right? We've all, we've all seen car, not seen hopefully, but we all know about car bags, right? And the idea of making a car bag is to fold the entire, you know, material in such a way that on impact it opens up. Now if I ask you to look at that crumpled ball, right, can you open it right now? Can you see, can you see if you can open it, right? I'll give you five seconds to open it into a full sheet. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, stop. Stop. Without tearing was the underlying <laughs> assumption. <laughs> but do you realize if this was a car bag, how difficult it would have been, right? So obviously the whole car bag has not just been, you know, butchro putro and put inside, right? It's been folded in a, in a very organized way. Even though some of you have been able to open it, it's not stretched out, right? There's a certain resistance to those folds, right? Yeah? Okay. Now this is what modern origami folds look like, okay? Apart from the lovely colors and the lovely folds and the geometric beauty, there's a purpose that they're serving. A lot of them are being used to put into stents and modern satellites. The problem with heart stents is that there's a tiny little thing. Do you know what a heart stent is? Right? There's a tiny little spring that needs to be put in an area which doesn't have space. It's supposed to go inside and stretch the artery. I learned it when I was in class 10 when my father had his first heart attack. And they explained it to me that it has to go in at the right spot and stretch exactly there. And I remember how difficult it was for the surgeon. Today what they're doing is they're sending it in the body and after a certain time when it gets warmed up with the, with the uh, temperature of the body, the material stretches itself and stays like that, right? The same problem of space that you have in a heart artery is what you have in outer space, that there is no space. Anything that has to be sent in outer space has to be compressed completely. I'll show, you, I'll show you more details about that. But remember that anything that needs to be compressed, like an umbrella or a stent, requires folding, right? And that now requires a lot of innovative folding. This is a foldable helmet that's made with cardboard. Uh, if you can see, this is the compressed version, which I can probably put in my bag. Then I get onto my bike in IIT and then I put it up and then I fold it back again and I keep it aside, right? What do you think this does? It's a, it's a one person boat called a kayak. It was developed by a student in his first year because from uh, his house he was being made to shift in a small little room where he had no space to keep a boat, right? So he came up with something like this, 
it, the whole thing is folded and it's easily portable like you like it shows but can you see the sequence of folds just focus on the left and the right are they symmetrical are they symmetrical folds right now this is a solar array right i'll show you very soon how this was made with this is obviously not paper but all the folds were made like this it opens up like this what would be the purpose of something like this being used solar panel but why fold it correct correct exactly to carry it in outer space right if it's folded like this it's like the airbag where it has impact and it opens on its own right you don't need somebody pulling it in different directions or to send something that's huge right so at the end this is a sample but at the end the finished model the folded model was 9 feet high so imagine how large it would have been so 9 feet is really one length over here the edge over here right now when i when i was coming here i asked myself that all oh, this is okay right but what's happening in origami right now as i talk and i googled origami in the news articles and i realized there's still a lot happening for example something that happened two days ago was that they are planning to send paper planes in outer space right there's a there's a japanese firm that's trying to do this and trying to trying to understand different versions or different forces that you know will will involve paper if it's thrown in outer space uh this happened on 27th may which is just a few days ago which is that uh to make sure that the impact of a rocket that lands on a surface is minimized they've come up with an origami inspired model like this right it works like this it opens up in that form so it's no longer one uncut square sheet of paper it's not one it's not uncut it's not square and it's certainly not paper and it they make that's called one molecule they make 20 of these and when there's impact on this side the impact on the other side is not is not felt at all now this was interesting this came up for those of you who are keen uh, as an origami installation that was done two days ago in a play in delhi right uh and this was a video of somebody if you if you see there's a there's a huge you know container there the container is chopped off it opens up there's a dancer there's a choreographer who's called this choreography origami and this week you know she is putting it up in um, in pittsburgh the whole container opens up and moves according to different folds and then she does the whole display Okay before i show you this i want to show you a short film about how it all started right and i want to i want to just see if you can make a connection between origami and what we are about to do next which is just designing something right can you help me with that it all started with a flat sheet of paper no one knows how the ancient art of origami began but centuries ago in ancient japan they brought paper to life how could they imagine that the paper crane and dragon would transform a modern day science and take flight in a new century with roots in the 16th century origami reemerged in the 1950s as a revolutionary japanese artist akira yoshizawa inspired a new generation of not only artists but also scientists you had folks who took up origami as a hobby but were also in the scientific world asking the questions that mathematicians and scientists do how can i describe this concept mathematically but also the mathematical design techniques that you develop can be used for art and for technology so people could turn right around and use those same techniques to design folding structures whose purpose was not aesthetic but was functional There's been literally centuries of work by these artists doing prototypes in a very cheap material of paper and discovered motions that we would not have discovered using traditional engineering approaches. Once they understood the mathematics behind the art, 
engineers could use origami designs and movements to solve problems. In engineering terms, origami is a compliant mechanism. So a compliant mechanism is a device that gets its motion from things like bending and deflection instead of hinges and bearings. Origami then by nature is compliant because all of those folding hinges are relying on the flexibility in the paper. Although many origami designs are hundreds of years old, engineers must adapt paper designs to more rigid and durable materials using basic folds and abstract forms as inspiration. In some of the devices, it's harder to see the origami. For example, in one device, the origami helped us understand how to get the motion, but if you were to see the actual device, you wouldn't actually see much of the origami in it. It's, it's 3D printed out of titanium. Folding transformations from small to large, in particular, are very useful ideas, especially in space research. You have something that quite often needs to be big and very often needs to be flat or sheet-like. But the only way of getting it into space is to send it up in a rocket. And rockets have very limited space. And a nice thing with a lot of origami is you can make it very compact for launch. And as you get into space, you can deploy and be very large. I'm working on an origami-inspired deployable solar array for spacecraft. The spacecraft would be inside an, a rocket, like an Atlas V rocket. And the solar array would wrap around the outside of the spacecraft. And it would be all folded up compactly and then launched into space and deployed. By using origami principles, we can get a much larger array into space by stowing it compactly during launch and then opening it up once we're in space. Because mathematical formulas can be scaled to any size, origami-inspired designs are useful in many disciplines, including electronics and medicine. Based on Kirigami, a variation of origami, utilized in pop-up books, this four micrometer thick nano injector is a microscopic compliant mechanism developed for gene therapy to deliver DNA to cells. 400 nano injectors could fit onto a single one centimeter square computer chip. The biggest thing to learn from this kind of research is that you can find inspiration for designs from anything. If you're open to inspiration from any of these sources, then your creativity is, is not limited. It all started with a flat sheet of paper. Now, through origami-inspired design, it has been transformed, reimagined, elevated, but still reminiscent of an ancient art form. Origami, having deep roots, is an ancient art. You would think that as a field of exploration, it would have been played out long ago. But the opposite is true. It's as vibrant and growing as ever. As we look to the future, there are no limits on the horizon, either artistically or now in this new technological area in the applications of origami-inspired design. Let me just ask you this question. Are there other words that you now relate to origami or to design? Are there other words that you now associate with origami? Other than what you had written and put up over there. Are there any other words? Mathematical, could you just come and put it up over here? Could you just write over here? So if I say the word origami, What are the various other words that we are now associating origami with? It could be the ones you've already used also. So I'm saying let's just make our own word cloud here. Go ahead, go ahead. So you said mathematical. Anybody else? Please, please just write it over there. Thanks. Anything else? Yes, sorry? Puzzles. Please write it over there. You can give it back to me. Anybody else? Please write in there. Thank you. Thanks.
Anybody else? The, the back bench, yes, please. Anybody else from that side? What is it? Okay, all right. Can I have the pens back, please? Thanks. Anybody else? Anything else that comes to your mind? It could be very random words as well. Organized, please go ahead. Sorry? Please, please just write that down for me. There's one pen that's missing. The back row here, anybody? Anybody else? Any other words at all? No? That's about it? Anybody else? Any other words? Sustainable? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Please put it up. Please put it up. Any other? Sorry? Imagination? Okay. Anybody else? So we have scientific, puzzles, patients, experiments, mathematical relations, rigid, thanks. thanks. Any other words that come to your mind? Sorry. Pattern, please put that up for me. Anything else? From the last bench over there. Backest ventures. Anything else? Packing. Thank you. Anything else? Anything else? Okay. So compact, folding, thank you. Natural science, organized, packing, sustainable experiments, imagination, patience. Puzzles, scientific, pattern, and rigid. Do you remember the word cloud that we had seen earlier? Do you realize how a lot of these words were actually not there? Right? A lot of these words were not there because that word cloud was not made in the last 10 years probably. Or it wasn't made by all of you. What we're going to do right now is we're going to um, get hands on now. Okay? Uh, the question again is why is origami making such a comeback? Why is it more than just a children's pastime now? And I'm throwing open the question to all of you. Why is it that it's exciting a lot of scientists and designers? What are some of the things that origami offers or has or promises that are exciting innovators, scientists or just tinkerers or makers? It's a systematic scientific study rather than a child's play, okay? It's material and space saving, so it's cheap and it can be compressed, yes? Somebody raise their hand. Space saving, okay? So could you flesh that out for me? Possibilities, isn't it? There are many other things that you can do with simple folds, okay? In different ways as well, okay. So it's more like a technique rather than a model, right? Okay. Yes. Flexibility, okay. Sorry. Form meets function, okay. All right. Sorry. It's fun learning, okay. Yes. That's true. Yes. It has its application in various fields, yeah. It's a quick solution finding. I'm glad somebody brought that up because which, which is why I'm here, right? Because a lot of prototyping is now being done in paper. Not necessarily the post-its that are in front of you, but there's a lot of, a lot of uh, design thinking prototyping that is done in paper with origami because like he said, it's quick. Like she said, it's, uh, it's feasible to make different kinds of structures across various fields now. 